Thank you, Trey. How beautiful. What a relief that we don't have to know all the answers to experience that place of freedom, that we can embrace the mystery and embrace the not knowing and find our freedom in spite of that. So I love that. Here we are at Palm Sunday already, next week being Easter. So we're finishing up our Lenten series on healing and the healing stories of Jesus. And I want to remind everybody of the idea that's behind this series with the beach glass, the idea of tikkun olam, which basically in the Jewish tradition is the third creation story where God took divine light and placed that divine light in vessels of not God, and those vessels could not contain that light. They could not hold that light, and so they shattered. And that what is our job here is to gather up the light again through our actions, through the ways in which we live so that we can once more be those vessels of divine light. And it is through these healing stories that we come back to that awareness of the light that we are. So as I've been doing, I'm going to begin today with a healing story that is once more coming from the Gospel of Matthew. This one is found in the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 8. And after getting into a boat, he crossed the sea and came to his own town. And just then, some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your son sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he then said to the paralytic, stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. When the crowds saw it, they were filled with awe, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to human beings. And again, that's from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. So I want to give a little bit of context to this particular verse, because what we see here is this idea that Jesus is blaspheming by forgiving sins, because you see in the Jewish tradition, the only one to forgive sins was the divine, was God. There is a tradition within Judaism, we see it in Hebrew scripture, where there is within the temple structure, the priests who are able to um, offer the sacrifice to God to, to forgive. There is the Day of Atonement where two goats are bringing, brought into the temple and the sins of the people are placed into those two goats. One is sacrifice to God as a transaction to forgive our sins and the other is let free. It's where the idea that we have of a scapegoat comes in. It's a placing the blame on something outside of ourselves and in this a ritual seeing that God then is able to forgive our sins. So there's a transaction that must take place. And that transaction must be an offering to God so that God can then forgive. But you see, Jesus stepped outside of that in this particular example of healing. There wasn't a transaction. There wasn't a giving of one thing for another in order for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven. And therefore, the scribes believed that Jesus was committing a heresy, blasphemy. What I find interesting within this story is that when that man was laying there, that paralytic was laying there, and Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven, the man did not get up yet then. Outwardly, was there a demonstration? There wasn't. 
But I imagine being that paralytic man laying there, believing in his mind that he was less than, that he was unworthy, that for some reason he was experiencing this paralytic body for some sins that either he or remember the belief was it could come through your family that your family has committed and now you are suffering as a result of those sins. And to hear those words, your sins are forgiven, must have mentally, emotionally brought a sense of healing even as he did not yet get up and walk. But it was with the words, get up and walk, that he did get up and walk. Now, in unity, you know I've spoken about our taking Scripture and interpreting it metaphysically. And so what does this particular parable, this particular passage, have to tell us metaphysically? Jesus came on a boat and came to his home. Where is our home? Where is your home and my home? Is it the walls of our homes that surround us? Is it the community in which we live? Or is it possible that wherever we go, whatever we do, wherever we find ourselves, we find ourselves home when we take that breath and center in that Christ spirit within? And taking that breath and centering in that Christ spirit, do we become aware of the thoughts that we are holding, the feelings that we are feeling that are out of alignment with the truth? Because that's what unity teaches us that sin is. Unity teaches that we were not born with original sin, but in original blessing, going back to that book of Genesis that said we were created not only good, but very good in the image and in the likeness of God. So we come home when we recognize that we have been carrying ideas within us that have kept us from remembering this truth. We are holy, holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Holy, holy. One with the divine. Always have been, always will be. It is only when we in our minds and hearts forget that, that we act from a perspective of separation from the divine. There's the sin. And at any moment, we're told, at any moment, Charles Fillmore tells us, we can turn again to God and release that error consciousness and once more come home to that Christ spirit within. And that's where it begins. It begins in mind. It begins in our hearts. It begins with a choice. Forgiveness is nothing more than choosing to give truth for error, to change our mind and to remember the truth. And when we do that and we take up wherever we are and follow Christ, what we will experience is a transformation in our lives. That transformation may not appear the way we think it must appear. Sometimes we get attached to the ideas of of what it must look like in the outer world if we are truly transforming ourselves. But what we can know is that when we take up our, our cross, as Jesus said, take up your cross and come follow me, when we take up those things that we are walking through in life and follow Christ, a transformation will occur. Now, within Christianity, what we find is that there is this idea that is embedded there of that transactional relationship with God. Perhaps, like me, you were taught that Jesus had to die on the cross for my sins. So you can hear the transaction in that. To appease God, Jesus needed to die for us. It might interest you to know that the original idea was that Jesus died for our sins to appease Satan. The first thousand years of Christianity, that was the transaction. And then around the year 1000, Saint Anselm changed that idea to the idea that Jesus did not get crucified on the cross to appease Satan, to release himself and us from Satan's clutches, but now it was to appease God. Jesus became the scapegoat 
for us, if you will. And in that understanding that a transaction has to occur, this in order for that to happen, we forget that Jesus' walk this week to the crucifixion was not a transactional exchange. It was a transformational exchange. What unity teaches is not that Jesus had to die for you and I in order to appease God. What unity teaches is that experience is one just like we all experience where life brings us to a place and we are walking through a challenge and Jesus showed us in the worst possible way, the, the biggest fear that we have of death and how that can come, he showed us how to walk even through that in that place of Christ-centeredness, in that place of forgiveness, in that place of love, in that place of compassion, in that place of understanding. Here is what we are called to do. This is a transformational practice, not a transactional practice. And we can get to that transformation when we remember, no matter what I am walking through, I am holy, holy. I am whole. I am one with that divine power and presence that is God. And that divine power and presence within you and within me provides everything that we need to meet each moment in grace. Where I get off, perhaps you too, is that I have an idea that if I am walking in the way of Christ, then my life is going to uh, unfold like a yellow brick road of opportunity. All will now be well. My challenges will disintegrate before me. But we only need to go back to the life of Jesus in this Holy Week to recognize that as we are living in these bodies, in this temporal realm, things happen. We live in a world of duality, of ups and downs, of good and bad, suffering and not suffering. And I know that I'm not going to say that there was something wrong with Jesus' consciousness that he had to be crucified. And I don't think we should do that to one another either. So that if you or I are walking through a period in which we are experiencing a sense of loss, a sense of loneliness, a sense of despair, a physical um, disability within our body, whatever it may be, that that we don't condemn one another. What have you been thinking that brought you to this place? No, we we simply return once more to that Christ spirit within, to that place of loving understanding and hold one another in that place of understanding and, and simply be that love, that love that Jesus demonstrated that is our transformational experience. That's the resurrection experience. So in the series, we've looked at integrating health and healing into every aspect of our lives. You'll recall that we started with these bodies. These bodies that we're told within Christian scriptures are the very temple of God. Have you actually taken the time to think about that? Because I know I forget that. This is a temple of the divine. Imagine, if you will, in your mind's eye, if you've ever been to a sacred or a holy place where you knew that divine power and presence was there, whether it was in a temple or in a church or in a a place where you could feel that energy of the divine out in nature, whatever it was, there was something about that in which you held such respect, such honor, such love. Here, I experience God. And take that same understanding and apply it now to your human body. This, too, is a temple of the divine. And ask yourself, how am I in that treating the body that I'm living in? Am I still stuck in the old thinking that that this body is nothing more than a temporary vessel to get me through until someday I can be reconnected with the divine in heaven? 
Or am I walking through this life with that remembering, I am the temple of the divine. How will I treat my body knowing that it houses the very spirit of God within it? And so within physical healing, this is what we're invited to think about. Allowing that inner wisdom within us to guide the way. How do I take care of this temple of the divine? Am I eating the foods that are healthy? Am I getting enough exercise? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I taking time to rest, to renew physically within this body? And if dis-ease shows up within this body, am I condemning myself? Am I judging myself or something else for the experience that I'm having? Or am I simply taking a breath and remembering the truth in spite of appearance to the contrary? I can change my mind. I can choose again. And I can take charge of those areas that I know I can take charge of making choices that I know will demonstrate the health and wholeness of my body. And much of that is also tied in with then our mental health, which is the second place that we went to with healing. Our our mental health that for many this past year has been impacted. As we have walked through this past year, today marks a full year that Unity Spiritual Center has had its doors closed. How have you and I walked through this year mentally? Many people have experienced that isolation, sadness, depression. Many people have then turned to their addictions. Suicide has likely increased. We're still seeing the statistics of this past year. But our mental health has suffered as a whole as we've walked through this time. So what can you and I do to support the mental health within us? Again, the answer lies in remembering that Christ spirit within When when I'm feeling isolated, when I'm feeling alone, when I'm feeling sad, when I'm feeling depressed, to know that I am not walking through this alone, that divine Christ spirit within me is there strengthening me, uplifting me, guiding me with wisdom into what choices can I make to support my mental health. What does that look like? For each of us, it may look different. But again, to understand that we are not to scapegoat and we are not to blame and we are not to say that we should be ashamed because we are experiencing symptoms of sadness, loneliness, depression, anxiety. We're here to simply be love in those moments. Holy, holy. And then we have our intellectual health. What are you feeding your mind? What ideas are you putting in there? Are they ideas that are uplifting and inspiring, or are they ideas that, again, continue to victimize and blame? You've got a choice. I have a choice. Over this past year, what have you filled your mind with? For for so many, myself included at times, it's been to get too caught up in social media and a lot of the junk that goes through that, rather than filling my mind with that which is uplifting, inspiring me to deeper understanding. How are you supporting your intellectual health? Again, returning to that divine Christ spirit and allowing the wisdom of that divine Christ spirit to guide you, to lead you into your next right action. We talked about community health. And how we as community can show up in healing ways with one another. Unity Spiritual Center has been doing that throughout this past year. And one of the ways that we are currently doing that is with our food cart that's outside right now, filled with food. For anybody who has a need to have some healthy, wholesome food, it's out there right now. And whatever extras we have, we donate it to a local food bank. We have our prayer shawls out there. 
As a community, we want you to come and take those prayer shawls and give them to others. And I want to call out Sandra Busher today who did just that. And we had a thank you card from somebody that she gave a prayer shawl to who said, I feel the prayers. It's a work of art. So how do we as community support health? Well, Jesus showed us how, and it's not transactional. It's not if you do that, then we'll do this. It's a transformational community in which no matter what, we love one another. We accept one another. We encourage and inspire one another. We see the truth in one another. We see that you are the Christ here, ready to express your full potential, and how can we support you in doing that? And then we moved one step further to our environmental health. Remembering that here too, Christ is. That this is not a fallen world where God is not. That this is an inspired world where Christ is all that is. And just like I have to ask, how do I take care of my body, knowing it houses the divine, I also have to ask, how do I... Uh, take care of the earth and nature, knowing it houses the divine. And as we take and integrate all of those pieces together, what we get is a transformational experience of living as that divine Christ life that we are. What has been called throughout the ages as the path of the mystic, the path of the mystic, which isn't based on intellectual understanding alone, but that takes that intellectual understanding and combines it with the heart, brings those two together, and lives each moment in the awareness that God is here expressing in, through, and as me. There is our transformation. That is the way that Jesus showed. And that was revealed through this holy week as he walked the way of the crucifixion. As we recognize that we are holy, holy, we will not demand that suffering not occur to us. We will not uh, resist the shadow nature that is inside of us, that is there within all of us. We will embrace all of ourselves and all of one another and recognizing within it all that we are holy, holy. And I'm going to support that way for you. And I'm going to support that way for myself. And I'm going to walk through whatever it is. A year of a worldwide pandemic, fine. I will walk through that with love in my heart. A, way, a year of a polarizing political environment, fine. I will walk through that with love in my heart. And opening up once more of unity doors, yes, I will walk through that with love in my heart. This is how transformation occurs. And this is what Jesus came to say. And with that Hosanna of Palm Sunday, that Hosanna, save us, we recognize that it, it wasn't Jesus the man that saves us. It's that Christ spirit within that he so perfectly demonstrated that transformed him in his life that will transform us in our life so that even as we are walking through these crucifixion experiences we know on the other side of that is the resurrection experience but that's next Sunday's message so let's take a look at how we are going to practice this this week In this series, we have seen that Jesus' healing actions often get a buzz from the onlookers. This day, we saw two different reactions from the crowd, shouts of adoration and scoffs of judgment from religious officials. His words and actions seem to get one or the other, praise or accusations of heresy. But he continued his work anyway. To be followers of Christ is not an easy task, but it is the way that we become whole once again to participate in the holy endeavor of bringing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. 
And so as you and I journey through this Holy Week, what is one commitment that you can make to take steps, no matter how challenging they may be, to reveal the light of Christ that you are? Not attached to what it will look like on the outer, but aware of the transformation that is taking place within you. And if you have your Zen garden and your pieces of beach glass, I invite you once more to place your piece of beach glass into your garden this week and to contemplate that idea. The way of the mystic is the way of the mystery that Trey sang about. It's the way of not knowing, but knowing I am home anyways. And in that, I am set free. And as you and I allow that to be this week, we will experience the transformational journey of the resurrection. Thank you, friends, and God bless.